Good morning, colleagues and distinguished guests. Thank you for joining us for what we hope will be an informative and exciting webinar to release the New Jersey Education to Earnings Data Systems new report entitled Benefits of Education in New Jersey. My name is Angela Bethia and I am the Assistant Secretary and CFO for the Office of the Secretary of Higher Education. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this event that has been a year plus in the making. The NJE's data system is a result of a cooperative effort among four state agencies, the Office of the Secretary of Higher Education, the New Jersey Department of Education, the New Jersey Department of Labor and Workforce Development, and the New Jersey Higher Education Assistance Authority. Our statewide longitudinal data system began in 2012 when the state received the first of two federal U.S. Department of Education SLDS grants, the second grant we received in 2019. Today, we release this major research de deliverable for the NJEs with many more planned, others in the early stages of development and others very close to completion. So we look forward to future convenings where we can share these products. On our agenda today, we will have opening remarks from our esteemed Secretary of Higher Education, Dr. Brian Bridges, followed by a presentation of the report highlights by one of the main authors, Dr. Sean Simone, Director of Research and Evaluation at the Heldrick Center for Workforce Development at Rutgers, followed by a panel of higher education leaders, then a moderated Q&A, where we encourage you to submit questions into the Q&A feature of the Zoom webinar. And finally, Chad May, our Director of Research and Analysis, will provide closing remarks. We look forward to a robust discussion and the value of post-secondary education in New Jersey. I now would like to introduce the Secretary of Higher Education, Dr. Brian Bridges, to provide opening remarks. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for what is sure to be an exciting and informative discussion with our researchers and very esteemed panelists who I am grateful for, for taking time out of their busy schedules to join us this morning. Everyone tuning into this webinar has most likely heard the age-old refrain, is college really worth it? It's become deafening over the last few years as we all grapple with the after effects of the pandemic. A small but growing number of skeptics point to the evolving nature of our economy and workforce as evidence that a college degree is no longer a useful pursuit, especially given the student debt burden. And yes, we all know that the average cost of college continues to increase, which remains a constant source of concern for students and families and policymakers like myself. But the wages of Americans without a degree are simultaneously decreasing. Not only are jobs that require just a high school diploma becoming less lucrative, but they're also becoming scarcer. By 2025, 65% of job openings will require post-secondary education or training beyond high school. And that's why New Jersey is charging full steam ahead to achieve our 65 by 25 attainment goal which seeks to ensure that 65% of our residents of our working age adults have a high quality credential by 2025. We are committed to preparing our residents to thrive in the emerging economy. So played by this question over the value of a college degree, my team and I met with the Heldrich Center in the fall of 2021 to discuss a potential research agenda that could leverage New Jersey's longitudinal data system for New Jersey students to shed light on this persistent debate. What is the return on investment for New Jersey students who complete their degrees at a higher education institution in the state? I'm thrilled that today we have a report that is rooted in the real life outcomes and experiences of New Jersey residents. This report documents and analyzes the short and long-term outcomes of higher education for New Jersey residents by following graduates who completed their degrees in 2012 and 2013 from public institutions in the state and tracking their earnings seven years after graduation. It affirms what we've always expected, suspected, and to some degree the researchers told us, the benefits of a college education are clear. Higher education is a worthwhile and life-changing investment for students and families in New Jersey. In the long term, more education yields higher net positive lifetime earnings, even after adjusting for the cost of attending college and the ripples extend far beyond students and their families. The state also reaps enormous social and economic benefits from a more educated population that
that is healthier and more actively engaged in their communities and our democracy. It is critical that we counter this dangerous narrative that college isn't worth it. If we focus on the outliers, the 2% of folks who end up with exorbitant debt uh, in return for their degree, we miss the larger picture. We miss the fact that higher education is a powerful tool to accelerate upward mobility, especially for those who have been historically underserved, many of whom attend the institutions represented on this panel. For many graduates, a college degree is key to achieving success in the workforce, but too often, students from marginalized backgrounds are not able to participate fully in the economy because they lack the credentials and training to do so. That's why it is imperative that equity is always a part of these conversations around return on investment. If we leave this narrative unchecked, it disproportionately harms those students who stand to benefit the most from a college degree. There's no doubt that the workforce is evolving. And with that, the experiences that comprise a four-year degree must adjust. And we see examples of that to ensure that our students are equipped with the knowledge and tools they need to thrive in the emerging economy. Higher education will have to reimagine the four-year degree path to sustain the remarkable benefits highlighted in this report. And I think the leaders on this panel uh, would agree to that as well. From day one, the Murphy administration has been committed to creating opportunity for every family and moving our state forward. We cannot be the state of opportunity unless we ensure that our residents have the skills to land the jobs of their dreams and make opportunities reality. I'm so proud of New Jersey's commitment to putting a degree back within reach for thousands of students through historic investments in higher education, from launching the community, co the community college opportunity grant and the Garden State Guarantee, to making college costs tax deductible for families, and now to helping the nearly 1 million residents with some college credit but no degree return to school and finally earn their credential. This report underscores that we have been on the right path all along and our work is still not finished yet. So enough of me talking. I look forward to today's conversation. Thank you. And I'll turn it back over to the moderator. Okay, so now we will move on and have Dr. Sean Simone, uh, one of the authors of this report, and he will uh, go through some of the top line highlights. Uh, so, Dr. Simone. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Secretary Bridges. Uh, before I uh, move forward, I just wanted to acknowledge all of the authors for the report, even though I'm the one talking, uh, this was a team effort. Um, we have uh, some number of people on our staff, uh, like Christine Bacani, as well as uh, two uh, student uh, researchers, uh, Jessica Cruz Nagelski and Ahmed Zavar, uh, contributed uh, to uh, the findings in this report. Well, first, uh, why did we uh, study this topic? As Secretary Bridges was noting, the media is putting out lots of um, editorials and reports on this very topic. Um, and this survey right here is a big concern to us because the millennials of the generation are there uh, in some surveys, they're indicating that you know college may not be uh, worth the cost. Um, there are opinion pieces and reputable uh, publications such as the New York Times indicating that college may not be worth it anymore, including uh, a study by Goldman Sachs where they break down um, uh, the population and look at the benefits and costs of higher education, as well as the student debt where my colleague Nick Hellman out of the University of Wisconsin does a lot of work in this space, uh, shows that um, th that continues to increase from students and it does become a great burden um, as people progress through their lives. The public see these stories. Um, especially uh, students in high school at their formative age, and they're making decisions uh, about maybe I shouldn't go to college because debt is scary. Uh, there's not much information, especially those that don't have other people going to college, that they're confident that they can pay the debt off. Uh, they see um, their parents, for example, that they may be struggling paying off their mortgage with credit card debt, and they may see them default, and they may decide, you know what, this upward mobility is not worth the risk. 
Um, and uh, there's an education piece that may need to occur for them to make the decision to go on for further education. So we started off with two questions. Uh, we wanted to look at the benefit for the individual in the state, uh, but as well, we also wanted to look at the benefits uh, to the state and the federal government itself of its citizens going on to further education. First, in examining the individual benefits, our findings indicate that seven years after graduation, there is higher income, the higher degrees uh, that you get. High school graduates seven years after earn about $42,200, which is well over the minimum full-time wage in New Jersey, but may not be a living wage. Um, if you look at the top end of the continuum, the doctoral degrees uh, are making you know close to a hundred thousand dollars or one hundred twenty-five thousand uh, dollars after seven years of of work. Uh, the bachelor's degree students uh, are earning about twenty thousand more uh, than the high school graduates. But a median or an average is the middle. You have half the people making more and half the people looking earning less. And so you really want to see the distribution of wages in order to get a good understanding uh, of how much people are making. If you look at the lower uh, degree levels, uh, high school especially, high school graduates around 42% uh, make less than $20,000 uh, per year. Whereas uh, on the graduate degree levels, especially the doctorates, the doctoral professional practices, 60% make over 100,000, and the, the uh, PhDs, uh, about half of them make over 100,000 uh, seven years after graduation. For the bachelor's degree students, compared to high school, very few, uh, about 13% compared to 42%, make under $20,000 a year. Whereas on the higher end, uh, you have around 13% making over 100,000, whereas in the high schoolers only 2%. So you see these narratives coming up about these successful entrepreneurs like Bill Gates without a high school education and, and everything like that, making a lot of money. And yes, those stories do happen, but uh, on average, only 2% of high school students uh, make, uh, <clears throat> make over 100,000. And that's something important to keep in mind. But let's look at the return on investment. You have, I've shown you that yes, higher degree levels do make more money, but is it worth the cost? Well, first let's take a look at projections of income over uh, the next 30 years after graduation. And you see that these differences persist. High school graduates uh, after 30 years of work make around $90,000 per year compared to uh, doctorals degree recipients with professional degrees making 222,000. Uh, doctorates making 200,000, and look at the bachelor's degree, they're making 130,000. Now, this is cumulative. These are per year. So this, uh, this increase uh, accumulates over time and, and increases the household's wealth. When taking a look at lifetime, at lifetime income and subtracting the cost of college, you get these numbers, these lifetime earnings. High school graduates make around $2.7 million over the course of their lifetime. Compare that with bachelor's degree graduates, which make around $1.2 million more, which is slightly more um, in New Jersey than the national average. I believe the national average is around a million. When you look at the higher level degrees, um, it accumulates even more with the professional practice doctorates making 6.4 million and the academic doctorates making 5.7 million compared to that 2.7 million. And this is after taking out the cost of loans um, and the actual cost of, of college. And we were very conservative in these estimates. We, we did the full cost of college without considering any grant aid or any family support or anything like that. So this is the worst case scenario you're seeing here. It's likely that these numbers are better if you were actually to look at real data uh, and look at uh, and deduct the cost of grants, uh, which there's a very robust grant program in this country uh, for lower income students with the Pell Grant and the Tuition Assistance Grant in New Jersey. Now, these benefits carry on to government. And this goes to why uh, governments should consider investing in higher education or post-secondary education or post-secondary training and see the investment coming back. 
This slide examines the projected tax revenues um, seven years out uh, from graduation. <clears throat> As we see here, doctoral degrees get more than three times higher than those that earned associate's degrees and 12 times higher than high school graduates. You can see that the doctoral uh, professional practice recipients uh, are contributing around $16,000, $17,000 in taxes, both in state and federal taxes, compared to high school with only $1,400. Now, you notice for high schoolers, there's no state tax. Well, in New Jersey, when you look at the average uh, tax revenues, that the lower income get a, 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 a negative subsidy back. So we're actually paying those, those individuals making less than $20,000 uh, with tax credits and, and refunds, um, and they're not able to contribute to the tax base. Um, and then only when you get to bachelor's degree and higher do you start seeing those tax incomes come in seven years after graduation. Now, over the course of a lifetime, for state taxes, you'll see that uh, doctoral degree recipients contribute $156,000 to New Jersey's tax revenues, master's degree uh, recipients uh, $95,000, um, and bachelor's degree graduates $75,000, compared to high school, only $32,400 over the course of their lifetime um, to the income. So we see, as we educate more of our citizens, and we attract more of the high talent into the state, the state gets you know, actual tax benefits. For the federal government, um, it's even more. Uh, 600, nearly $600,000 in taxes come to the federal government for the doctoral degree recipients, 300,000 for master's and 242,000 for bachelor degrees compared to 100,000 for high school graduates over the course of a lifetime. Keep in mind when you're looking at this, think about how much it costs per person to fund a Pell Grant recipient uh, throughout the course. And if they were able to get them higher degree levels um, through, uh, uh, through their lifetimes uh, and how it pays for itself over time. Even though on average, the college degree does pay off, there is a little variation in there. And so when we kind of look at what industries and what majors are paying off more than others, we have to keep in mind for policy purposes where we need to invest our resources. So bachelor's degree graduates working in the utilities industry, for example, and in manufacturing and in management of companies and in construction are making uh, the most um, when going into uh, the workforce. You know, seven years after graduation, you're seeing that people in the utilities industry, which right now has a lot of investment in New Jersey, in the green jobs, um, the, you know, uh, you know, kind of executives trying to solve our energy problems and such, um, they're making uh, the most money. And they're also attracting uh, kind of like, uh, you know, some of the higher paying majors, engineers and such, and the like. Now, when you look at the percentage growth over time, um, you're also seeing that there's a lot of variation here that we have to keep in mind. Let's take a look at the food services. They're getting 67% increases in wages. Well, why is that? You have to think about when someone graduates with a bachelor's degree or something like that, those wages are very low to start. So those wages have high growth because they're on the low end. Um, you have at the bottom end, the low growth sectors, other services like public administration, retail trade and education services, um, well, education services, for example, start off in the top third, the report shows, in initial wage, but their wages grow only 18%. And in education, that makes sense because there's a lot of demand for getting higher level degrees to push your wages up. When we target policies, we have to keep in mind that even though the higher the degree, the more income you make, it also depends on your major and what fields that you go into. For majors, the engineering and computer science graduates, computer information, engineering technologies, business management, and health professions get the biggest bang for the buck. Uh, we also have to keep in mind there's a lot of variation in liberal arts. There could be jobs to go in for liberal arts, 
but those average wages are lower because there's more diversity of jobs to go into and the, and many of the students um, may not be as career focused and may not need a lot of assistance there. So know that some majors may fall below those median wages and those are where the policy focus, uh, the, the, those are the positions where we may need policy focus. So when we're looking at these stories, nearly half of the millennials say they're indebted and that colleges are not worth it. College may not be worth it anywhere for the New York Times. This Goldman Sachs study said the college may not be worth it. These people are not crazy. These people are making legitimate critiques when you read these articles about the higher education. Uh, those critiques focus on those people that start college and don't finish. This analysis is only of those that complete college. If you rack up debt, and you're not able to finish two years out from college or three years out from college, uh, you have that debt and you have that lower income and you're paying the debt. That's the argument that some of these people are making. Readers are taking the, these, these high, highlights and these headlines and saying, oh, it's not worth going to college. But the policy intervention occurs where, the, where Dr. Bridges was talking about, the some college and no degree, those are the high risk people. Um, and those people that start a degree and don't complete it. Um, on average, about 50 to 60% of people going for bachelor's degrees get the degree. There's a big gap where 40% don't get that credential and still have uh, some debt and are not able to pay that debt off. That is what these people are kind of talking about. They're highlighting some policy problems that are in the system. Not that overall that we have uh, a big problem you know, getting in the degree and having it pay off. It's that operability part that we have to focus our, our policy interventions on. And with that, I'll turn it over to Chad, our moderator, who will facilitate the panel. Okay, thank you, Dr. Simone. Um, and so <clears throat> we'll go to the next slide and introduce uh, the, our uh, presidential panelists. And so first, we have Dr. Nancy Cantor, who's Chancellor of Rutgers University, Newark, is recognized nationally and internationally for emphasizing the role of universities as anchor institutions in their communities, especially by forging diverse cross-sector collaboratives and leveraging publicly engaged scholarship to advance racial equity and equitable growth. As a social psychologist, she has focused on understanding how individuals perceive and think about their social worlds, pursue personal goals, and regulate their behavior to adapt to life's most challenging social environments. Dr. Cantor has led Syracuse University and the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and was provost at the University of Michigan, where she was closely involved in the defense of, an affirm of the affirmative action um, court cases to the Supreme Court in 2003, the cases Gruder and Gratz. She co-chairs the President's Alliance on Higher Education and Immigration Steering Committee and co-edits a book series uh, entitled Our Compelling Interests from Princeton University Press with Errol Lewis. Welcome, Dr. Cantor. And we'll introduce our, our next panelist, Dr. Lavelle Pugh Bassett. Um, became the sixth president of Camden County College on July 1st, 2022. Dr. Pugh Bassett previously served as the vice president for institutional effectiveness, advancement, and strategic initiatives at Camden, Camden County College since 2021. This marked her return to higher education after 20 years with the New Jersey Department of Education, having served in a number of capacities culminating in the role of Camden County Executive County Superintendent of Schools. Dr. Pugh Bassett believes that her posi positioning at Camden County College reflects the essence of her core commitment to community and considers herself fortunate to yet again be given an opportunity to work and serve. She believes that it is, after all, the inherent mission of a community college and its service to its community. Welcome, Dr. Pugh Bassett. I think we have two outstanding panelists to, to respond to. Uh, we, we've crafted a few questions for the panelists. And so um, the next slide will go. So uh, we'll, we'll start with uh, Dr. Cantor. As you think about the topic of the report, <clears throat> 
return on investment of post-secondary education as it relates to your institution and sector, what finding was the most salient and, and why? Thank you very much, Jet. Um, I'm delighted to be here. And I think this is a really important, obvious topic and, and great report. Um, I think I'll start really by talking, focusing as, as Dr. Samoon did on the basic value of post-secondary education relative to the cost. I was particularly struck by um, tables looking at the percentage earning below minimum wage um, after seven years after graduation um, with a 14% um, for bachelors and 40 versus 46% um, with only a high school graduation. Um, and then obviously the basic value is relative to cost. So all of the data that were just shown about lifetime earnings relative to cost and foregone wages, the fact that with a bachelor's degree, for example, you break even in eight years, I think is a very important thing, especially as we worry about student debt um, and affordability. And then from the perspective of Rutgers Newark, we have an extremely diverse student body. In majority of our students are Pell eligible, many first generation students, as my colleague at Camden County College has, and a highly diverse student body in terms of we're an H uh, Hispanic serving institution, an Asian American, Native American, Pacific Islander serving institution. We have no majority ethnicity, and we welcome our dreamers from New Jersey. And I talk about the different populations because I think a whole argument about the value of higher education really needs to look deeply at different populations and where they're positioned. So we know New Jersey is this incredibly diverse state, but we also know it has a very substantial wealth gap for our BIPOC residents. And so that to me and being an anchor institution in New Jersey's largest city that epitomizes those wealth gaps um, and education gaps, it's really important to have to start with the basic value. And I think that goes back to what was argued in terms of the growing distrust, if you will, in whether post-secondary education is worth it. Um, there have been lots of studies out as, as my colleagues, Dr. Bridges and Simone mentioned. And I think what's really critical here is that leaders of higher ed in New Jersey start with the basic value and then dig into pathways to affordability, transfer programs, the kind of ecosystem we build between county colleges and four-year institutions, the way in which we think about how we put our arms around academic pathways and pathways into the knowledge economy, as was talked about. Um, and we can talk about that as we go on, but I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, and Dr. Pugh Bassett. So uh, first of all, let me just thank Dr. Bridges for, Secretary Bridges for um, allowing me to be a part of this discussion. Um, I have a unique perspective as a community college since most see community colleges as a transition point between um, high school and obtaining a bachelor's degree. And being that stepping stone institution, most look at us as not necessarily the pathway for employment, but um, the obvious uh, takeaway from looking at the tables is clearly that even with an associate's degree, um, students are earning much more than they would if they simply had a high school diploma. And to Dr. Cantor's um, comment with regard to that pathway piece, community colleges could essentially, um, if we continue to market it appropriately, could be the most affordable option to be able to obtain that bachelor's degree, thereby kind of counter arguing the, the point about how expensive college is and how um, it lacks affordability. But the, the metric that I think that stood out to me the most, particularly as we deal with some of the issues we're dealing with and trying to beef up and, and review some of the programs we offer on campus, is the final table that speaks to the um, healthcare profession seeming to lag behind other majors and industry types. 
um, we know based upon some of the um, intimate conversations we've had with building up our RN and BSN programs that nursing is really um, a lot more robust. There is a significant shortage, particularly in New Jersey, which happens to be one of only seven states estimated to have such a shortage. Um, and there are opportunities for folks to pursue um, some nursing careers as well as other um, health industries like surgical technology, radiology, health information manager, occupational therapist, and that kind of thing. The thing that really did not surprise me was the uh, points of data that reference computer information sciences. Uh, we have been really beefing up our cybersecurity opportunities, computer information science um, systems and data science areas to be able to offer that as a pathway for students in our institution. In fact, um, as we talk about the area related to arts, entertainment, recreation, um, we have been looking into areas where where our students could maximize their opportunities and have since implemented our uh, esports production degree, where we are looking to have our first cohort in the fall with 60 students who have mm -hmm. enrolled in this opportunity, um, which has a revenue and earning potential of $62,000. So there are opportunities for students to be able to consider pathways in, in many industries that they may have um, thought not to be a, a pathway that requires a, a degree, a post-secondary degree. And certainly using community colleges as a pathway to obtaining that bachelor's degree, as I mentioned earlier, would be one way with which we could counter the, the narrative about affordability. Um, Camden County College had reduced in the past two years our tuition to $99 a credit. But I'm not sure that students really understood the value of that reduction in order to be able to offset the long term costs of higher education. So I think that there might be a messaging thing that we might we might have to um, address with regard to that. But there is no question in my mind, based upon the information that was presented, that we are still in a position where post secondary education is the most um, the, the best pathway for someone to be able to uh, kind of increase their life chances. And we're not just talking about individuals, we're talking about communities, we're talking about families, um, we're talking about the greater good. All right, thank you, um, Dr. Cantor, Dr. Pugh Bassett. So our second question, um, how do you envision your institution using the data insights and information contained in this report? Are there, you know, specific initiatives on your campuses that you think this information, is there an area where some of this information could be used in marketing materials or, or admissions and enrollment management? Um, you know, how, how would you, you know, think about, um, you know, possibly leveraging this information now that, that the report's out? I'll take that. I'll take that on first. Um, we have, there are two things that are happening on campus that I think this, this information could lend itself to. The first being the fact that we're embarking upon our strategic planning process. This information would be um, very useful in how we outline the ways with which we're responding to the needs of our students. But more importantly, we have undertaken what we're calling our back on track program. It's the program that's responding to the state's desire for us to look into some college no degree. We actually kicked off our uh, this back on track program in October and started off with a bit of a pilot. We only looked at students who may have about 20 credits left to degree completion, reached out to those students to see what we could do to get them back, try to address any barriers that they may have. And since October, we've gotten 35 students to come back and re-register for the spring. In fact, we have one success story where the student has already applied for graduation. So we're really super excited about that. But for us, I think the more important thing is really trying to keep track of those barriers that were identified by those students. What are the reasons why you may not have finished? And I think in some cases, to the point about um, that some college no degree start stop student population, the, the issue might very well be that the institution in and of itself is the barrier. Are there costs that are prohibitive? Are there classes that don't seem to make sense to those students? We have begin, we've begun to kind of re-examine 
whether a calculus class is necessary for a student obtaining a business degree. Would it not be more appropriate for that student to take an accounting class if we wanted to make sure that the, the classes that they took were pertinent to the pathway that they were pursuing? Some students kind of tap out when they get to a class that serves as a brick wall for them. And so trying to figure out how to make that more amenable for them so that they can continue on is of utmost priority to us. The other issues that have been um, expressed as barriers are childcare. We have a childcare center on our campus we can connect students with. Sometimes students don't realize that that childcare center is available to them. We have students who had outstanding bills that we decided to not necessarily forgive, but we put it on the back end. So we have a deferment process where students, if they re-enroll, will not be prevented from enrolling for the purposes of um, trying to kind of get them back so that they can pay their bill off over time. So there are some things that are useful to us in this exploration of students with um, some college, no degree to determine whether or not we need to revitalize some of our efforts. Maybe we need to build programs and services to support students that we did not know that we needed. And maybe we need to revisit others that haven't been very useful. No, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pubasset. Dr. Cancer. Yes, I, I think um, we also are building a big re-enrollment. So I'm really thrilled to hear my colleague talk about their program. And I know very excited about Secretary Bridges' commitment to this. Um, I also want to really emphasize that we in Newark, for example, have the Newark City of Learning Collaborative to really engage cross-sector across our city and greater Newark to think about how to increase the college going rate of city residents and those in greater Newark community. And then across the state of New Jersey in terms of low income, first gen, BIPOC, immigrant dense New Jersey communities. So the way in which we will be using this, these data and other data that are collected nationally is to really make the argument that there's a reasonable opportunity for post-secondary education. We need to dig deep and think about not only the earnings data, but then how affordable access gets paired with that. And for us at New Rutgers Newark, that's where our run to the top program for first and second year students for with low income family incomes for part time students. I think we need in New Jersey to pay more attention to part time students. We need to increase summer tag, for example. We need to really be flexible in the way in which we dig deep, but we can combine the data in here about lifetime earnings and about um, earnings across different fields with our attention to what, how do we make that accessible? And then I want to go back to how do we smooth the pathway between county colleges where the vast majority of first-gen New Jersey residents will have their first taste of higher education, how do we smooth that pathway in key fields? Because we are really intent on diversifying the knowledge economy fields that are in this report and that you see as high earning fields. How do we do the pathway in STEM, for example? And we have the Garden State Guarantee, the Bridges to Baccalaureate program that looks at county college to four-year institutions in STEM, and how do we really engage that? How do we look at fintech fields? We have a big collaboration now with the fintech, New Jersey fintech firm Pfizer. How do we think about professional degrees in business, public administration, some of the degrees that, that low-income students may not see as accessible, but that we know have real return on investment? And so what we want to do is really smooth those pathways into those degrees and then into careers. And so we are looking through our Braven program, for example, at strong job attainment. So we want to look not just at earnings, but we want to look at, what, for example, intergenerational social mobility. So we can show in our Braven program, which is a career accelerator program with internships and build social capital networks with firms all around New Jersey, we can show that six months out, 55% of the students in our Braven program are out earning their parental incomes in their first job out of college. 
And I think when you dig deep into these data, we'll be able to see, and I, I'll make some comments later about how we really need to disaggregate these data, because it's really important to be able to give this message to different pools of talented students in New Jersey who might not otherwise think that either these fields, these high income fields are accessible or that the full pathway from county high school to county college to four year institution is accessible or that indeed it is debt, it, that the debt burden is really reasonable for them. And given the, the Garden State Guarantee, given our run to the top, given what my colleague is doing at Camden County College, we can really make the argument now, I think, that for otherwise marginalized populations, New Jersey can be affordable and accessible and that we can make an entree into these high earning fields. Uh, I, Chad, I want to take over things, but uh, our two panelists just made my day. So that those are both good, good comments to go into the weekend with. Um, I, I do want to make a note before Chad moves on that we did have another panelist from the independent sector. And uh, he had a, 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 an issue that uh, prevented him from participating at the last minute. So we'll be thinking about him. Um, but, uh, but great comments and great to hear that uh, both of you are as committed as you are to um, what you're doing and being able to leverage the resources and commitment of the state to help facilitate or accelerate the work that you're doing on the ground. So that's my two cents. Chad, back to you. No, thank you, Dr. Bridges. And and Dr. Cantor, you, you kind of led us into the next area of conversation. Um, and so, you know, as, as all good research does, it, it spurs sometimes more questions than it does answers, right? I think as, as academic researchers, we all know that that's, that's kind of one of the driving forces of research. And so in that vein, you know, what are some, what are, um, Oh, I think we skipped the question. Can we go back a slide there? Um, what are some unanswered questions that this research report didn't address that you think is important to measuring return on investment for your students and for the state of New Jersey? Yeah, so I'll, since I ended with that, I'll start with that. Um, and that is, um, I really want to see the data in this database um, ultimately disaggregated um, to really make the case for different diverse populations within the state. I think this is an overall set of data that's very compelling. Now we want to really dig in and make the case for our different populations, do it by income and class, by race and ethnicity, by immigrant undocumented documented status, by geography and school district, first gen populations. There are lots of ways that we can um, disaggregate that. And I think that's tremendously important because we're count, we want to be able to benchmark our institutions against the national data with respect to, for example, huge black-white gaps in debt burden. We know the disparate impact of that. Ed Trust has produced lots of data on that, um, as have other, other organizations. So it'll be very important to really be able for New Jersey to really be able to make the argument about the return on investment relative to different groups. And those different groups we will anticipate will start off in different positions, but we'll be able to benchmark our progress as we move against those initial initiating positions. And really, ultimately, that will close the wealth gap. And that really has to be, I think, our, our eye on the prize there. Um, then I think as part of that, I would love to see the data here disaggregated, not just by, let's say, county associate's degree versus bachelor's degree, but actually look at populations that have gone from an associate's degree to a bachelor's degree, that have gone from a high school degree to an associate's degree, so that we can actually disaggregate by those pathways, because we're constantly trying to make the argument that the ecosystem of higher post-secondary education is indeed 
can be a collaborative ecosystem. So we really need to make the argument that we can see what's happening to individuals as they go along that pathway. And then I also would love to see data that broadens what I would call that landscape of higher education and value. So for example, the New Jersey um, Prison Education Program, which many of our institutions, we happen to be the organizer of NJSTEP, but many of our institutions are involved in that. And that is both prison education and then reentry education after prison. I want to see what the value of that is, because we will really be able to make a very strong argument, I think, that in terms of costs for the state, that it is worth making sure that both our incarcerated populations and our reentry populations have a foot in the door towards post-secondary education. And then finally, I want to see what, well, two things. I want to see what the value of pathways into these different fields. My colleague at Camden County College spoke beautifully about the need for really digging into the data and finding out about these different fields and the pathways into them. Um, so, you know, the categories in this report are very helpful, but they're broad categories. And I, as a social psychologist and, and a fan of the arts and humanities, I don't want us to leave out the possibility, for example, that science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics can be a pathway in. I don't want to leave out all those journalists we could be producing. I want to really dig in and see um, how we can show value to some of the career paths and some of the majors that lead to them that might get left out because we think about um, particular high income, high reward um, fields. One of the most interesting data points here is that even for the, the so-called low earning majors, that you actually see progress over time in the career path. So I think if we can disaggregate by that, it will be very instructive. And the final thing I would say is that we need to push back now into K-12. So we're very focused on, and we are very focused on the pathway, dual enrollment, for example. I would love to see the value over time of those students who do dual enrollment while they're in high school and take some college credits in county college or in four-year institutions like ours. Um, I have a very strong view that those K-12 to post-secondary pathways have been ignored, and that's where we often lose a lot of the students. So I think we need to um, pay more attention to that. And this gives us a great start. This database will really give us a good start into that. So I'll stop there and turn to my colleague. I don't even know how to follow that. So I totally agree with just about, um, well, not just about, with everything that um, Dr. Cantor just, just shared. I'm delighted to hear um, a representative from a four-year institution talking about dual enrollment and the importance of it, because that really is um, one of our growing populations at community college. So I agree, looking at more data about that would be significant. I, I do want to just kind of elaborate on one of the things that that um, Dr. Kenner shared with regard to students who are justice impacted. That is That is a huge point of concern for Camden County College. We have a juvenile justice facility in our backyard and um, we do serve students if we're if we're um, kind of being true to who we are as a community college we are essentially the third fourth fifth and sixth chance for many students who don't think that they have an opportunity to be able to flourish in a four-year environment and quite frankly feel like they're too old to attend a four-year institution our um, core population of student is between 20, 25 and 49 um, years old. So we do have a population of students that seek support who have been justice impacted. And when I use the term justice impacted, it doesn't mean that they themselves have been involved in juvenile justice, but surely um, they may have had both parents incarcerated. We do have students who age out of foster care who have histories that relate to trauma and lack of access and opportunity that come to our institution. 
But I would love to see that data peel apart the impact of obtaining a degree on the rates of recidivism. We know that 60, 76%, um, according to a study done by Emory University, 76% of incarcerated Americans return to prison within five years. That number drops to 55% for high school graduates, 30% for those who complete vocational training, and 13.7% for those that receive an associate's degree. There is no question that there is a significant impact on uh, pursuing a post-secondary opportunity for someone who is justice impacted. And I would love to see not only what that looks like in terms of earning potential, but surely what that looks like in terms of good citizenry and, and ways to be able to give back in terms of the um, tax base and, and um, job opportunities and so forth for the specific communities that, that they enter into. So for me, that really stood out the most as a as a, an area with which I would love to see a little bit more information because that would help me in trying to identify how we offer services. We've started first with offering touch points with our family court system and probation. We are creating opportunities and pathways where a judge can mandate that a student come and be a part of one of our programs as a viable option for probation so that those students are not wasting time doing ancillary um, community service efforts for the purpose of coming up with something to do, right? We're not, I'm not downplaying the importance of serving the community, but surely if there were very targeted pathways that speak to opportunity, that speak to um, increase in access, increase in job opportunities and such, that would have much more of a positive impact on that student not returning, that young person or that individual not returning into the justice system. So if I if, if we could um, get that data broken down, not only um, with regard to justice impacted, but also in the ways that Dr. Kanner shared in, in terms of dual enrollment and those other categories, I think that would also be very useful for those of us who are um, trying to create pathways because you know these conversations are going to have to happen in, in collaboration. There's no way that we can work in isolation anymore when it comes to that. And so those of us who partner as community colleges with four-year institutions for pathway opportunities, we're going to have to have those conversations together to figure out how we can create a seamless system of service and support for our students. No, thank you, Dr. Pubasset. Um, sounds sounds like there's a lot of work that can be done to help move the state forward and individual institutions. And you know, we'll hope to continue to leverage the New Jersey Education to Earnings Data System, um, or whatever our statewide longitudinal data system may be called in the future, um, to to you know put more of this research out and put you know break down, disaggregate the data so that we can learn, you know all about the different types of students that, that attend across the state. And, and, and so lastly, um, you know, what are some ways in which your own institution has measured return on investment? Um, you know, we all know that um, our accreditor requires institutions to assess their academic programs. And so, you know, if you could talk a little bit about how, you know, those activities sort of you know, merge with um, measuring return on investment. And if there's any specific examples of certain degree programs where um, you think your institution um, has a highlighted um, ability to where they really focus on that, um, please, um, you know, share. And we'll start with Dr. Few Bassett since she is Thank you. So I, I have to say that this was a question that I struggled with because our measurement, it's very difficult at, as a community college to, to measure this, particularly for those students who are um, transitioning straight to a four-year degree. Um, we do certainly have reciprocal conversations with the institutions that we partner with to, to kind of figure out um, where our students uh, fall when, when they're um, pursuing their, their degree programs. We certainly do have a system for reviewing our degree program offerings to determine which ones um, are getting um, the most enrollment, which ones are falling kind of by the wayside. We certainly do partner with business and industry to determine whether or not there are associate degree programs that we have that are no longer 
necessarily um, popular when it comes to that specific industry, or if we have to revamp them a bit to make them more uh, current. Uh, so for us, it's really just trying to keep up with what what those what degree and certificate programs are germane to what industries are um, hiring students now. Um, but like I said, there is a bit of a, a challenge for us because many of our students are going on to four-year institutions. And in some cases, if I'm being honest, they graduate from our institution with the liberal arts focus and maybe start to hone in on their specific area of, of interest when they become juniors at these institutions. So we don't necessarily have a great handle on that, um, but I can say that as we begin to develop some of these more targeted programs, I mentioned the Justice Impacted, I mentioned our Back on Track program, where we are starting to collect a lot more data to be able to give us some information about the impact. I think that we'll, we'll begin to try to figure out how to create a culture of measuring this as we move forward. No, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hugh Bassett. Uh, Dr. Cantor. Yes, I mean, I want to um, start by going back to what I mentioned before. So, for example, we are really intent on building social capital networks for our largely low income, often um, forgotten and marginalized populations that are so talented and so ready to, to really change the fields. And so, for example, our Braven program, what we do is we calculate the return on investment by looking at the strength of jobs after graduation. And one of the things that, that is so important for us is that we're looking at national peer data. We're looking at low in other low-income students of color, um, other marginalized populations, and we're looking at their the peer data on strong job attainment. The Braven program, our latest cohort, for example, produces 24 percentage points above the national average for the attainment of strong jobs six months out of school. Um, that's, a, that's really substantial because we're looking at students who typically in the past you might not see in strong jobs when they're first out of college. And that's what we really want to assess. One of the things that we've been seeing nationally is that there is indeed, I, I'm not a big fan of rankings, but there is indeed a lot more attention in the national rankings on social mobility and on measuring bang for the buck. So it really leaps off of this report to say that we pay a lot of attention to closing a gap in graduation rates between Pell and non-Pell students, for example. We pay a lot of attention between first looking at making sure that our first gen students are getting the right social capital networks into um, the corporations that make up so many of the first jobs, um, whether that's our business school sending students on to JPMC and Deloitte and PwC and Prudential, et cetera, at a much higher rate than one would be expected nationally by the, the kinds of students that we are um, seeing talented and enrolling here. And then the other thing I want to say that we look at return on investment by paying attention to the full student journey. And I think that often gets ignored. So my colleague talked about that earlier on, and I really want to um, emphasize what Dr. Pugh Bassett said, and that is it really matters that we create a strong and supportive environment all along the way. So we're using a, what we call Run for Success, a, a digital access program that is really looking to follow these students. Are they taking unnecessary courses that lead you know, on paths that take longer and therefore might outdo their federal and, and state financial aid and our institutional aid? Are they in... Do they have, for example, 60 credits, but no degree, as we talked about earlier? How do we put our arms around um, the full package? We create our care team to really say that, you know, issues for our students are, are sort of a suitcase approach. You open, you come in and you say, oh, it's about debt and financial aid, but then it turns out to be about housing or food insecurity. 
So we need to take a very broad perspective on return and investment, return on investment. And that is say, we're going to maximize return on investment when we smooth the experience of being in post-secondary education for students who don't have, who don't start on third base, if you will. I always say, you know, higher ed is so obsessed with students who actually would have made it no matter what, but it really leaves to the side students who are incredibly talented, but they don't start on third base. They need, and we really need to make sure that we are looking at return on investment for precisely those students. We create minors, for example, at Rutgers Newark, because that may be the way to get a student into a career path, even when they come in to another field, majoring in another field. So for example, one of the ones I'm most proud of is we have a data science minor now that is really attracting attention. We do what we call everyday data. And what are the opportunities for students in a whole variety of fields? You know, we think of computer science as just about STEM, but in fact, there are, we need data science individuals in marketing, in the arts, in media. And we, by having a minor, we can really plug them into high reward fields that they might not have otherwise entered. And so I think that's something that we all need to do for institutional transformation. Return on investment cannot just be seen as a simple targeted major. It has to be seen as a full robust path where you're bringing in students from very different perspectives. And in this regard, the last thing I'll say is, I really worry when we leave out the humanities. I worry when we leave out the arts and cultural majors, because in fact, all of our, when I talk to my corporate CEO partners, they all say those students actually bring enormous talent, whether it's in Prudential or it's in Audible. They bring talent to what might otherwise be seen as fields that don't recruit from the humanities or from the arts and cultural disciplines. So I don't want to, even though those might rank low on the initial return on investment, I don't want to leave out those fields and I want us to track those fields. No, thank you, Dr. Cantor. As, as being an undergraduate in history, I, I certainly um, sympathize with those thoughts on the humanities and, and often have had many debates over my career on uh, <laughs> you can't actually get a good job as a history major. Uh, but uh, so now you did. I, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, and, and having a high school senior who is looking at colleges right now, it's 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 definitely a different perspective as a as a parent than having worked in higher ed for my you know last twenty three years and and now working in in the office of the secretary of higher education, it's it's definitely given a different perspective. So all of those out there that are parents and have had older children, you know, you you all know what what I'm talking about. So. Um, but thank you, colleagues. Thank you for your, your wonderful thoughts. And, and we hope that this report will continue to build momentum, continue to, to ask, encourage us all to ask good questions about the, the ecosystem of higher education. And so now we're going to turn it over for um, a little bit of time to, to respond to some questions from the audience. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie at Heldrich to um, flag any questions and, and see if we can't um, answer any questions from the audience. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, everybody. This has been a really insightful and engaging conversation that we've all enjoyed a lot. Um, we have a few questions that I'm going to start getting to. And then just a reminder to anybody who has outstanding questions, please put them in the Q&A and we'll ask them to the relevant parties. Um, so I want to start with this first one, which are for the panelists, what are your views on non-degree credentials, not just short and long-term certificates, but also licenses? Oh, I'll take that one. Um, you, you know, community colleges 
are kind of divvied up between a credit and non-credit pathway. Um, we have actually increased our um, enrollment in our workforce development programs. And um, I, I believe that to be a viable pathway for um, someone to um, obtain an opportunity to advance in business and industry or a career pathway um, for students who do not seek to sit in a classroom and earn a degree. Um, what we've done in terms of um, beefing up those pathways, however, is offering students an opportunity to be bridged to the credit side should they be interested in doing so. So for example, um, we do have a large enrollment in our cosmetology program. However, for those students who want to open up their own business someday, we offer the opportunity to be able to take classes in business management because you will not only need to know how to cut hair or do hair, you'll need to know how to manage the salon that you're working in or the barbershop that you're working in in order to be able to be successful. So, um, uh, workforce development and career pathways is a huge part of who we are. And, I, and it was something that if I was giving an opportunity to close, I was going to mention. So thank you for giving me that softball question to be able to get that information out there. Um, it is an important option for some of our students. And I think in some cases, the only option that gets them in front of us. And so the when we talk about post-secondary education, I want to be careful that we don't forget that there are workforce and career pathway opportunities that exist within institutions of higher learning. It's not separate and apart. Um, so it's not just earning a degree, but there's a way for us to be able to connect students with apprenticeship programs and really earning potential that might in some cases be higher than those students who are earning actual degrees. So the plumbers and the carpenters and some of those other industries where our students are very successful are opportunities for those, those students to be able to have an impact on our tax base, to have an impact on their earning potential and such. Um, so I am I am a firm believer of, of that part. Yeah, if I might jump in for just a minute, I totally agree with my colleague. Um, and one of the places, for example, we are seeing that is very important is when there are new burgeoning fields and we want to get our community members involved in those, we often are thinking about creating credentials. So we've been partnering with Audible to think about how we could get a community-based um, program in digital media. So, And that would be a credentialing program, not, not initially a post-secondary um, full degree, but but it's a burgeoning new field and we want to see how we can get the community engaged. So it's often, as um, Dr. Pubensett said, it's often one step into a degree program. Another example in is in the whole area of entrepreneur, entrepreneurship. So our Center for Urban Edu Entrepreneurship and Economic Development and our um, are you flourishing program, for example, with formerly incarcerated um, entrepreneurs is a, is essentially a credential program, but it's hugely impactful in thinking about return on investment. So I think there are lots of creative ways to think about credentialing programs. Um, and again, it's got to be part of the whole post-secondary ecosystem, as Dr. Pew Bassett said. Excellent, thank you. I'll, I'll pass this over to Dr. Simone to think about the data elements of what we have in the data system, how we might be able to address some of those questions. Yeah, I also answered this uh, live. Um, right now, we are limited um, into just only uh, degree granting um credits degree credits credits um and there's a lot out in the ecosystem that we don't know about but that is a targeted area that we would like to focus on in, including some colleagues here at Rutgers um, and there's also a national movement to look at the um non-credited credentials and the value of those in increasing um mobility um up so hopefully in the next three or so years uh we're definitely going to get um, some data from the national, uh, the, the New Jersey Department of Labor and Workforce Development on their training provider list, which does include some community colleges, 
but uh, also work with our community college partners because um, the federal government's requiring now more information and we can be leaders in this area and try to organize that information in a way that's uh, very helpful. Thank you. So the next question is that the state of New Jersey is home to many immigrants. And based on this um, attendee's experience as an educator, a high percentage of this population experiences financial difficulties when pursuing their degrees. And many of this people in this population um, don't meet the requirements for federal loans. So their question is, what does New Jersey do to help those young immigrants reach their potential? So I'll take that. I mean, and I think I think Dr. Bridges actually put an answer in um, the chat or, or somewhere as well. New Jersey is actually, I do a lot of work nationally on higher education and immigration, and New Jersey is actually very progressive on this front in that we do have um, we do have, for example, New Jersey TAG for DREAMers. The one issue there is that it requires um, three years in residence in a New Jersey high school. And I think um, for the future, and I have talked to the higher ed, the Assemblies Committee on Higher Ed about this, um, it would be really helpful to think about students who may have less than three years um, in residence in a New Jersey high school to open up um, TAG support for. Um, the other thing we can think about um, is really how we get, for students, we have to really look ahead and think about what happens when DACA um, potentially gets overturned. And if it does, then we have to think about credentialing and professional licensure and the ways in which we can expand that. Um, so there are a lot of pieces of the immigrant puzzle that we need to think about, but um, just on the basis of pure state-by-state -state comparisons, New Jersey is quite progressive in terms of in-state tuition for undocumented students and um, eligibility for TAG um, if you are a New Jersey, if you've been in residence in a New Jersey high school um, for three years. And again, I'll pass it over to Dr. Simone to ask a related question of what are the subgroups that you can examine for this report? And um, do you have the capability of looking at the experience of immigrants? So, yes, I know we were talking about a lot about subgroups, but usually the first pass of what you do in a top level report is just doing the overall uh, estimates. And I think that both the panel and the uh, the uh, people asking the question are right on that in order to understand how to do better, uh, we have to kind of understand the these differences. I think one of the uh, comments from the panelists is like looking at, or, or uh, I think on chat was like looking at, okay, look just above the median, how, uh, what, what predictors are pushing people to make even more than the median and maybe, you know, kind of uh, inter intervene that way. Um, the, what we can do with the data we have is, yes, we do have a lot of the demographic variables. We have, uh, you know, race and gender. Um, immigration is a little tricky. Uh, the state, as well as uh, our, our group, we do have a grant looking at foreign-born scientists and engineers. Um, and we're delving into the data a little bit there because New Jersey has a very high population uh, compared to other states. Um, but uh, we're limited into what is collected in our shore collection. All we have is citizenship. Um, and that is not exactly 100% aligned with that. So uh, we do with what we can, and we're looking into um, options to bring in more data partners to kind of look at those uh, issues. Um, and it's a tricky area because, you know, uh, uh, like with the DACA recipients, for example, if their status changes, then uh, we have information that um, they may not want to have. And they're, they're a population that, you know, sometimes are reticent about giving information in order to make policy better. Uh, but those are some things we could do. It, it does get limited, and everyone will see this. We're going to be releasing in the first quarter report an update, dash, updated dashboard on higher education outcomes. And we're going to be taking the feedback from the community and looking at demographics by institution. Um, but when we do so, our cell sizes get small and we weren't, aren't able to report out per our policies. So, um, yes, we can do those demographics, but when we do get into the weeds, sometimes we're not able to report the granularity that we, we want to and we have to kind of look at other things. But we have a lot of flexibility given the depth of the data in the, in the data system. Excellent. 
Excellent, thank you. So this question I think could be for any of the panelists or Chad from OSHI. Um, given that a lot of students drop out due to financial issues and that those experiences are most likely for students in those two years or less category, what are some ways that New Jersey can tackle both of those problems with bolstering financial aid, increasing student employment, and then working on basic needs issues like um, subsidized food and housing programs? Uh, uh, Dr. Ken, I'll take that if you if you if you don't mind. So there are a number of ways that that could be addressed, both from a state perspective and institutionally. Um, the state has actually. Uh, provided support to institutions to address issues around food insecurity. There, there are monies available for the development of food pantries to address those issues. And of course, um, much of the aid that we receive can be used to address barriers for students to succeed. Um, Dr. Cantor really um, touched upon something that I think I may have kind of marginally mentioned, but I think is significant to this issue around students um, running out of financial aid, right? And taking classes for no credit that ends up eating their financial aid and getting them to the point where by the time they are in their second semester of their second year, they've run out of aid and can no longer continue. I'm trying to really address um, the appropriateness of certain classes and ways with which we can uh, relieve students from taking credits for no, I mean, classes for no credits in order for them to be able to um, take 15 credits to finish and be done. Um, the other thing, institutionally, and I'll speak specifically to Camden County College that we do is we offer um, subsidies for our students by way of um, foundation support. Our foundation does offer scholarships to students. Uh, we try to exhaust student um, qualifications or eligibility for certain programs to make sure that we connect them appropriately. We certainly use some of the federal programs like work study and others to be able to support students. We have um, a student support services grant, we have an EOF grant. So there are other opportunities for our students to be able to receive support for their financial aid. But I think that again, um, just the messaging issue around students being able to start first at a community college and maximize their financial aid and their ability to be able to finish in with a four-year degree is key to some of this, this work because there are there's still this fallacy out there that community colleges do not offer comparable education and that they need to go straight first to a four-year institution where they really could not technically afford to attend and end up just tapping out before they can they can be done. And that happens within the first two years. So, uh, you know, I think there are a number of ways that we can address it. I think that um, institutionally, we try to leverage as many resources as possible to remove barriers for our students financially. But um, there is certainly more work to do in the messaging and, and, and again, the, the collaboration between two-year colleges and, um, and four-year colleges. And then finally, I think that this whole idea around dual enrollment is also probably the most affordable option. My son, um, for example, I mean, Chad talked about being a parent of a, of a high schooler. My, my, I have a 19-year-old and 23-year-old, both of whom took dual enrollment courses. And if you talk about, for us, it's, it's $150 for the course. So my son graduated with nine credits of, of college credits before he even got out of high school. Um, and I think that in that case, that, that could be marketed as an affordable option for our students to pursue um, a degree and, and perhaps um, relieve them from some of the barriers that they face financially. I, I couldn't agree more. I also want to throw back in there the, the issue of part-time students. And that's where often you find it very difficult to find financial aid programs. And we've been putting a lot of our own institutional aid behind that because, you know, especially given the hit of the COVID pandemic, a lot of families can't have a student go full-time and, and part-time is really an important um, option. And so we need to be very creative there. Yeah, in respect to that, I, I, I might just say that um, as an agency, we are, 
we will we are focusing on uh, as Dr. Bridges, Sec Secretary Bridges has, had mentioned some college no degree. And in that vein, um, there is a lot of discussion and, um, you know, not much I can say publicly yet, but um, look in the future, in the next few months, um, there will be a lot of, um, you know, things coming out about what you know, proposals are being put forward to to deal with part time students specifically and then um, building on some of the early work we're, we're currently doing around the some college new degree. And so, um, you know, just just wanted to, to let folks know that part time is um, especially as it relates to um, some of our existing programs and um, enlarging those programs to, to I'm students. All right, thank you again, everyone. I really appreciate all the questions and I know we're coming up on our end time of 12 o'clock. So I just wanted to ask this last one and then provide the panelists maybe in this response an opportunity to have any closing comments. Um, so this question is that, you know, we as educators are well aware of advantages of higher educational attainment. How do we counter the bad press that higher education has received? and help people to understand the advantages of a higher education degree. Well, I think that's what, in a sense, what we've really been talking about. And from my perspective, um, it's a dual message that we have to put forward. Part of the message is the value, the return on investment message. And part of the message is the realistic accessibility and affordability of going to a post-secondary. And related to that is really marketing the notion that my colleague, Dr. Pew Bassett just said about the, the stepping stones from K-12, dual enrollment, to county colleges, to four-year institutions, and the way in which that creates an accessible pathway, um, an affordable pathway um, in New Jersey and that we have creative ways of doing that, that we really work together and collaborate. Um, and we have to get a collaborative message across. I echo her sentiment. <laughs> Nothing to add there. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Um, Chad, I pass it back to you for the closing slide. Okay, um, maybe we'll we'll I'll I'll see if Dr. Cantor or Dr. Pubasant have any final concluding comments um, before we um, close the webinar. I, I do. So you know, I I think that, um, and this is going to speak right into some of what Dr. Cantor has actually said many times over. Um, there is an absolute need to recognize that um, post-secondary trajectory starts, I would even say, at middle school, right? Uh, as a K-12 educator for um, some time before coming back to higher ed, you know, I, I have often noticed that it's, it, you could, seventh and eighth grade, you can actually project a student's trajectory in post-secondary education. And we just have to be careful because... The numbers will say one thing, but there are some nuances behind those numbers that dictates a student's trajectory. And oftentimes there are populations that are disproportionately impacted by that. And I say, for example, a, a, an eighth grader who doesn't take the right math by eighth grade is not even able to access a bachelor's degree pathway um, outside of high school. So we just really need to um, continue to work collaboratively with our K-12 partners to make sure that there, the obstacles are not happening before they even get an opportunity to um, participate in, in the post-secondary process. There, there are um, barriers for access to advanced placement classes. There are barriers to access to honors classes that in turn um, impact barriers to being able to take dual enrollment courses. So we just have to be careful that we are um, not setting up a system that inherent, inherently marginalizes students. Uh, at Camden County College, what we've tried to do more of 
is create dual enrollment programs that don't require you to have an A or B in high school. That our audio production dual enrollment program, for example, allows for our middle of the road students to be able to earn a, a college credit as opposed to students who are just participating in the higher level courses because those students also need to see that they too have the potential to be able to, um, to function and, and be successful in a college course and, and college environment. So, I, you know, I, I, the numbers are one thing. The story behind the numbers to me are um, uh, something else. And, and it's important for us to remember that, you know, we'll walk away with this data, but there is going to be a lot more processing and analyzing of it in order to be able to make this an effective and seamless system of services for our students, um, starting again at the K-12 level and going all the way up through a pathway to community college, through community colleges, or directly through to a four-year, depending upon the student's trajectory. Um, but again, we cannot operate in silos and in isolation. We are, our system of education has shifted, our expectations from our students has shifted, the needs of our students have shifted, and we are going to have to shift accordingly. I guess what I would say in closing, and I agree with absolutely everything that was just said, what I would say in closing is that the diversity of our talent pool is New Jersey's biggest asset. And we have a, an absolute responsibility to make sure that the return on investment is there, that we feed intergenerational social mobility for an incredibly talented, diverse population. We cannot leave huge communities on the sidelines of opportunity and look ourselves in the mirror. So these kinds of data allow us to begin to think about how to look at populations and smooth those pathways and really look very intensively through a racial equity lens, through an income equity lens at what it means to provide opportunity. All right. Well, thank you again. Um, it has been just such a pleasurable time. And thank you to Dr. Cantor and Dr. Pew Bassett and um, Secretary Bridges. Um, you know, um, and thank you for all attending. Um, and <clears throat> just just some closing. Uh, remarks. Um, you can note um, the NJEDS website um, on the slide here. And um, this uh, Benefits of Education in New Jersey report is, I believe, and hopefully my colleagues at Heldrich uh, will uh, <laughs> either modify this statement, but I believe the report is live on the website now. And so, um, you know, attendees um, can click on that link and, and the reports out there. And, um, you know, um, I do believe there'll be some press releases and other, um, you know, materials um, going out, um, you know, within the next day or, uh, or into early next week. Um, and so just as, as, as a representative member of the Executive Leadership Council for uh, our statewide longitudinal data system, uh, we, we just want to really thank our partners at Rutgers for all their work on this report and, um, you know, thank um, all of our participating institutions. Um, you know, we can't support higher ed in the state if we don't have any institutions to support. So, um, you know, we, we certainly thank um, everyone for all the work that you do um, for your students and for, for New Jersey residents. Um, across the state, and we hope that we will, you know, be putting out more of these uh, research reports and opening up um, the statewide longitudinal data system, the NJEADS um, system, um, and, and having more of these types of events in the future. Um, and so I'll give uh, my colleague, Dr. Sean Simoon, um, you know, for any final concluding comments. No, that's it. Uh, I, I do appreciate all of our partners at all of our uh, agencies uh, for making this possible. Um, it, it It's an incredible effort, lots of trust, and um, 
And hopefully there'll be more uh, products like this that'll benefit the community. Uh, know, know that we're out there and we're trying to help inform uh, policy and just go to our website, sign up for our email list and email this email address if you have any questions. Uh, thank you so much. All right, well, thank you. Uh, thank you for all the attendees and um, we will close close out for today. Thank you.